Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church again this week. And we are continuing our series looking at Old Testament prophets. But this um, is going to be the last in that series. And so we're going to finish in a, in a similar way to how we started the series, by looking at a really well-known story, a story that is um, often taught in Sunday school um, and is probably um, a favourite um, of many people. We're going to look um, at the prophet Daniel. And as soon as I said Daniel, you've probably already guessed exactly which part of the story we're going to look at. But before we get to that bit of the story, shall we have an overview of just who Daniel was? Now, Daniel lived um, in the early part of the 6th century BC. And the book of Daniel is split into two halves. Um, the first half are kind of narrative stories of, of what happens to Daniel um, and his friends. And the second half are um, kind of prophetic, apocalyptic writings, um, the chronicles of dreams and visions that Daniel have concerning um, the end times, similar in some fashions uh, to the book of Revelation um, in the New Testament. Now the stories in the first part of the book of Daniel, of which today's passage is one, occur after he and the other Jewish nobility are carried off to Babylon. Um, following the capture of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar in approximately 604 BC. And the, the Babylonian Empire, their strategy for controlling the different parts of their empire was to take um, the brightest and the best young men, usually, um, back to the capital to serve there. And they left just um, a small remnant um, of people in the nations that they conquered, which then left those kind of nations in a place where organising any kind of meaningful rebellion against the might of the empire becomes a virtually impossible task. And so Daniel is amongst those uh, young men of good standing in Judah who are captured and taken to Babylon to serve in the king's court. And whilst there's certainly a theme um, of the writing that we have from that period about a longing to return to Jerusalem, and an example of that would be Psalm 137, which says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. You might remember it uh, from the Boney M song, but it, it definitely is a psalm. The psalmist got there first. Um, there's that longing to get back to Jerusalem. But despite that, the exiles are told through the prophet Jeremiah that they ought to settle down and they are to seek the prosperity and the well-being of the land that they now find themselves in. And certainly from the stories contained in the book of Daniel, um, we can see that Daniel and his friends take that advice to heart and they serve the king of Babylon faithfully for the most part. In fact, we're told that Daniel rises to quite a high position within the king's court, due in part to his ability to interpret dreams, as well as his diligence and his faithfulness. And he actually serves under three or four different kings whilst in exile in Babylon. There's some confusion about exactly how many kings. There's a bit of debate about it, but it's definitely three or four different kings, I think that he serves under. And so as we come to today's passage, and you can find today's passage in Daniel chapter 6, and so if you, um, as always, if you want to read that for yourself, you can pause me now and go away and do that. Um, but we'll kind of go through it um, and have a, a, a paraphrased version of it anyway. So as we come to today's passage, the king at this point is King Darius. And we're told once again that Daniel uh, distinguishes himself above all those others who serve in the court and that he rises um, again to a position of authority and seniority. And this displeases those amongst who Daniel serves. 
And, and we can infer from their actions, though we're not explicitly told, that they are probably native Babylonians rather than Jewish exiles like Daniel. And they come up with a plot to trap and to ultimately get rid of Daniel. And so they go to King Darius and they appeal to his ego and persuade him to sign into law a decree that no one can worship anyone or anything other than Darius himself for the next 30 days. Now Daniel hears about this law, but he chooses to go home and to pray to God in his window, just as he has always done. And the other satraps and presidents, those who are plotting against Daniel, see him praying in the window like they knew he would and they rush off to tell King Darius and the king is distraught because he loves Daniel but they convince him that you know Daniel has broken the law that Darius has signed and he needs to be punished and so his punishment is that he is thrown into the den of lions. Now you probably all know this part of the story don't you? Daniel is thrown into the lion's den, but God closes the mouths of the lions and he survives the night unharmed. King Darius, who has been praying for Daniel's safekeeping, then issues a new decree that all of the empire should worship the God of Daniel. And those who have plotted against Daniel are thrown into the den themselves and they do not receive the same miraculous protection which is afforded to Daniel. Like I've already said, this is a story that is often taught in Sunday school. It's a story that is well known. And you can see why, can't you? Like the story of Jonah that we started this series with, it has that kind of visual aspect to it. It has animals in it. It has a miraculous act of God. It's easy to see how this story captures the imagination of children and the imagination of adults as well. And it seems, doesn't it, to be a fairly straightforward story of being dedicated to God, of the need to put him first over the things of man of the need to prioritise prayer and time spent with God, the need to worship God alone rather than man or idols. That's certainly the way that it is often taught and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with understanding the story in that way. But I do wonder if there's a danger that if we only view the story in that way, we, we might miss some of the other things that are contained within it. I wonder if we were to look at it in a different light, if we were prepared to go a little bit deeper, we might see new things contained within that story. I wonder, as you looked at the story or heard the story this morning, what was the part that stood out to you the most? I mean, we could read this story contextually, couldn't we? In the light of, of our own situation, and certainly with the events that have dominated our news bulletins over the last few weeks, there could be a case for seeing afresh just how easily those in positions of authority abuse their power and manipulate the systems and the structures to oppress and victimise someone based on their ethnicity and their religion. We might recognise that Daniel was prepared to break an unjust law. Which brings to my mind a quote from Martin Luther King who says, One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And that's what Daniel does, doesn't he? He sees a law and sees that it's wrong, and so he breaks it. Perhaps we might see just how Darius was persuaded to keep order 
and to go along with the law, even though he could see that ultimately the law was wrong and that it might cost Daniel his life. Even though he could actually have repealed it at any time, a point shown by the fact that he does repeal it literally the very next day, as soon as Daniel is safe from the lions. But yet he's persuaded in that moment that actually the important thing is the law and that he has to keep order and so Daniel must be punished despite the unjustness, despite what it might cost. But the law is the important thing. We might see all of that and more perhaps if we were to look at the story again. However, for me, certainly, the part that always stands out the most in this story, or I say always, it certainly has done for the last perhaps 15 years or so since I first preached on this passage, the part that stands out most is the open windows. I mean, I understand why Daniel felt the need to disobey this new law, but could he not have found somewhere more private to pray? Why did he need to pray at an open window where he knew that he could be seen to be breaking the law? An answer of of sorts is that Daniel knew his scriptures. And in particular, part of the prayer of Solomon, which you can find in 1 Kings chapter 8, where foreseeing that one day the people of Israel may be taken captive, Solomon prays this. If they repent with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their ancestors, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea. Maintain their cause. And so therefore we can see that Daniel's prayer wasn't just about worshipping God um, over man and idol, but actually Daniel was doing what was required in order to free his people from oppression and captivity. He was doing what he felt he needed to do so that God would hear his prayer and set his people free. And so there then the important part about the windows isn't that they are open, but that they face toward Jerusalem. However, it does then perhaps bring us back to that original question, which is that surely he could have found somewhere more private. Couldn't he have found somewhere hidden that also pointed toward Jerusalem? And I wonder if the answer to that question might be found in something that my first boss used to say to me. It was my first youth work job and in my youthful impetuousness I was often more concerned with getting things done quickly rather than being overly concerned with what was best practice. And so my boss John would often caution me that it is not enough just to do the right thing but we have to be seen to be doing the right thing. And I wonder if as a leader, as someone in authority, as someone with the ability to influence those around him, I wonder if Daniel knew that it wasn't enough merely to do what was required of him. But actually the important thing was that he was seen to be doing what God required of him. And I wonder what it might mean for us to be seen to be doing what God requires of us. I guess the first part of that is that we need to know what it is that God requires of us. And whilst it's true that we are still called to pray, we're not called to pray in the same way as Daniel was. That time, that season has passed. Jesus 
warns, doesn't he, against the dangers of making a public spectacle of prayer. And even before Jesus, the prophets make clear that on their own, um, religious acts are merely empty gestures. And they are not what God requires from us on their own. And you can see it as a theme throughout the books of prophecy, throughout the prophets in the Old Testament. It's there in Isaiah chapter 1, in Hosea chapter 6, in Amos chapter 5, Jeremiah 7, Micah chapter 6. Religious acts, sacrifices, burnt offerings on their own are not what God demands of his people. But rather he asks them to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. To let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. So then if that is what God asks of his people, what then does it look like for us to be seen to be doing what God asks of us? The South Wales Baptist Association, I think, summed it up quite nicely in a statement that they released last weekend following the killing of George Floyd over in America. They write this. It is not enough for us to be disturbed. It's not enough for us just to pray. We have to do more to fight injustice. We have to learn to become a community of holy resistance, standing up for what we believe is right, speaking out against injustice wherever we see it, and use our places of privilege to give space and a voice to those who are ignored by society. It is not enough for us to be not racist. We must be anti-racist, which is a place of action. And to be clear, that is not a comfortable place to be. It may bring us, as it brought Daniel, into conflict with those around us, as well as with those in power. It may require courage and bravery. It may take us into situations that we would rather not be taken. We're not told how Daniel responds to being told that he is to be thrown to the lions. But I like to think that he responded in much the same way that his friends Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego reacted during their own rebellion against an unjust law. That story is found in Daniel chapter 3. In verse 17 of Daniel chapter 3, they say this. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Those are big ifs, aren't they? You see, there was no guarantees for Daniel, nor for Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego that they would be safe if they stood up and did the right thing. But yet they say, but if not. You see, even without that assurance of safety, they knew, that the, they knew sorry, the importance of not only doing the right thing, but of standing up and being seen to be doing the right thing. Similarly for us, there are no guarantees of divine protection. But there is the guarantee that just like them, we will not have to face any trials that come our way on our own. So might we, like Daniel, Be prepared to stand up and to do what is right. To speak out and act in our pursuit of justice. And to seek out the open windows so that others might see God working 
through us. Amen.